Real African stories, real African experiences. This is Legally Clueless After Hours. And in this episode, we'll catch up with Washira and find out what came after his ADHD diagnosis. Hi, everyone. Oh my goodness, it's so awesome to like have you guys here and have like people eavesdropping on our conversations. Um, Quite strange. And then strange, isn't yeah. it? So first and foremost, Washira, I'm so thankful that you could be here with us because he also, did you arrive last evening? Or yes, yesterday. Actually. Yesterday. So he also traveled yesterday evening just to make it in time for this. I'm very um, appreciative. Um, round of, I mean... Hands up for those who have listened to the episode with his story. And that hand went up so fast, <laughs> so fast, so fast. And Chris, how are you feeling? Um, jet lagged. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm excited because to see people who want to hear what you went through, um, I'm guessing it's to better yourselves. I hope so. Yeah. But um, I'm excited. So I loved having you on the podcast first because we connected on Instagram. Yes. And to have a black African man wanting to share stories around mental health and coming to a deeper knowledge of yourself, I think is so courageous and so powerful. Thank you. And so what I wanted to understand as well mm-hmm. is before we come to the after hours of your story, the pre hours, What are some of the experiences that you had that made you feel like internally there's something amiss? So I I I feel like I'm struggling with particular things. Well, um earliest memory is when I was younger. So we're in class and everybody's been given work to do, but I don't know where to start. (laughs) And it's probably some of the most basic math you'll ever have. And that, in that moment when I'm struggling to understand what I have in front of me and looking across and you're seeing people just doodling and doing things, that's when I started realizing that, Mm -hmm. okay, am I slow Mm -hmm. or what? Mm -hmm. Then uh, later on when when I got to high school, uh, they'd, I, did, I did the British curriculum. So they'd separate you, uh, in math class that is, they'd separate you in groups, three groups. So you had the, the really smart people, then you had the average, and then you had us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those who don't get it. That's terrible, why would they do that? <laughs> well, they, they, they they used to tell us that it's to encourage um it's to encourage you to to learn at your own pace. <laughs> no? yeah. well, I wouldn't be encouraged. <laughs> I mean but, okay. like if you look across the, the table and yeah. you see your fellow mm. students just looking out the window, it's like, <laughs> like we're they, together. Yeah, well, we're good, we connect. <laughs> yeah. But now imagine you're with someone and they're, they're on their calculator. <laughs> As, yeah. So they'd, they'd put it in, in, in a way that they, they'd make you feel special. Mm. But then some of the, the teachers um, started doing this weird thing whereby they, they'd put, let's say you're in grade eight, they'd remove you from your math class, your grade eight slow math class, and put you in like a, a grade seven or grade six class. So you can imagine the, the difference. You're that big kid and now there's this toy here and you can't do the math that they're doing. Yeah. So that's when I started like questioning myself. Yeah. Is it me? Um, is it the teacher? Uh, <coughs> like what's going on? Yeah. But then when it comes, when it came to now like going home, uh, We'd sit around the table to do our homework together at the end of the day. But sometimes my dad would come early, sit with us, and like take us through, he'd go through each, everybody's work. But then sometimes, like, 
dads, difficult people, yeah? <laughs> Sometimes yeah. he'd be like, why are you not getting it? Mm. Can you not see your sister has already finished her homework? Mm. You call the first question. Mm. And sometimes because um, now I understand as an adult, like life is, there's a lot of life pressure. So for him being a dad with uh, a son who's kind of not getting it, uh, then um, he's someone who used to bring um, the, the office stress back home. Mm. He'd take it out on me. And you'd get a beating. A thorough one, even with that homework book of yours. Mm. So I started asking myself, like, okay, from school to home, and then now with friends, like, I, I'd find myself secluding myself from, from people mm. because I don't want to seem like that guy who just is not understanding. Mm. But... Uh, now, as an adult so, um, with a diagnosis, I learned that I, I'm different. I'm special. I have my own way of learning things. Mm. So I don't blame myself. If I don't get it, I don't get it. Yeah. Probably it's not for me. Yeah. Not everybody loves math. I love physics. Uh, my girlfriend... Uh, <laughs> hi. Hey, can you guys admit hi, yo? <laughs> uh, there's this night, uh, we didn't have water. So what normally happens is that uh, Kanjo, when they open up for water, probably on a Friday, it goes into our tanks. Yeah. So we didn't have water for like three weeks straight. And I sat down and I'm like, I, I need to find a solution for this thing. 1 a.m., 2 a.m., I'm outside there with drenches and what, looking at the pump, they made to Anisha. Yeah. I've, I've not done anything to do with engineering. Yeah. But by the time I was done, it's like 4 a.m., there was water going into the tanks. Wow. So I'm special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Um, and I like that you brought up your girlfriend. We're going to get to her in a bit. But I know one thing that you also talked about in the, in the, in the story when we were recording was about in the phase where you didn't have a diagnosis, you got into, um, uh, what would I say? You were in a relationship that had some toxicity that was popping up. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, this toxic work is, word is overused or whatever, but it is a thing, it is right? A thing. Yeah, so yeah. We, we can't throw it away, it is yeah. a thing. Uh, how did you navigate leaving a toxic relationship as a guy in terms of support systems mm -hmm. like do men talk to each other about <laughs> relationships i don't know did you did you have friends you could go to and say this is what's happening and have a friend say hey that's not normal because that's what kind of happens for us how is the exit the exit <laughs> oh my goodness now i just realized you go for this year right yeah no, we talk about these things. Okay, great. She knows. <laughs> just like, I'm that's sorry. What, actually, that's one good thing. A pointer. Yeah. Be open with your person. Yes. Yeah. If it happened in your past and it's made you realize that it's something you didn't like. Yeah. And you've already moved on. Why not talk about it? And it, it did happen. It did happen. Yeah. It's not a lie. Um, do guys talk about these things? Well, yes. Uh, some guys do. Not, uh, it's not, it's not the same, um, the same way like ladies would do it. It's not emotionally sometimes. Uh, it's not emotionally based. Yeah. But you'd find guys like laughing about it. You'd make a joke about it. But then the part where it's different is that guys will not give you the advice you want to hear mm. or the valid advice. They tell you stuff like, ah, and they classify them. But I got out of that relationship by realizing that there's nothing here. Mm. There's this one uh, evening that I went home and back then when we were still together. So I went straight to my mom's house and she was like, your girlfriend was here earlier in the day 
and she was drunk. I'm like, damn. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I apologized. And I went back to the house. I didn't speak to her about it. But at that moment, I realized that this person isn't someone I would like to be with. Mm-hmm. You're going to my mom's house drunk mm-hmm. in the middle of the day. Uh, another realization was um, one morning when we'd come from the club and she'd had one of her, her moments where she goes bad-ish crazy. Yeah. Oh, you can say what you want. Uh, <laughs> she went bad shit crazy. Yeah. And I don't know, try and imagine a guy being beaten by a chick in a club. The way it would look. Yeah, to add to the other guys. And she even had the bouncers like kick me out of the club. Wow. So when he got home, Najangale in the mirror, Nimefura, and I'm like, Mini Nani? Who ni nani? Tunadunini pamoja. And then Mona na chapwana dim. But then I used to console myself by telling myself that hey, I love her. So mm. I can change her or she'll come to realize it. But that time when you're waiting for her to realize it, it doesn't come through. Yeah. She'll continue doing things and making things worse. Yeah. yeah. That's intense. It kind of like even speaks to like, um, kind of like definitions of masculinity almost. And so you're kind of having a mind F-U-C-K because it's like things are not correlating and like what I've been told a man is and a man is meant to be like, but this is not my present no. um, situation. reality, yeah, right? Yeah. And so um, what do you think was the hardest thing to deal with <clears throat> right after you left that um, relationship? Forgive myself. Mm-hmm. Understand who I was, what I wanted, and how I wanted to live my life. And also to do away with that love. Mm. So moving on from that situation, that reality of mine was was something I didn't see myself. uh, I didn't think I was capable of doing, Mm. letting go. Mm. Three years isn't a joke. Mm. So by the time uh, you've gotten used to waking up by yourself, cooking for yourself again, um, being seen alone, like that change is, it's it's difficult. Mm. But then coming to the reality of, I need to do this. Mm. This thing was not good for me. Um, It was, it was eating me up and I need to move on. That constant reminder, it was hard. Yeah. But hey, you have to do what you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. In this, in in Mashira's story, and if you haven't listened to it, I really encourage you to. to it's in a part. It's part one, part two. Yeah. Um, you also talked about something I had never encountered. Someone who's experienced this, so it was le- a learning lesson for, uh, space for me. You talked about being hospitalized, mm-hmm. and what I loved is it was so human like you talked about the night before you went out and you're like you know what since i'm going to go to hospital anyway let me just go i'm going to wild out tonight have as many drinks yes and then woke up very hangover and now it was time to go into hospital um maybe to shed some light on people who haven't heard the story mm-hmm. what happened before that moment to warrant, hey, I need to go to hospital. And then what was the experience in the hospital and the nature of the hospital you went to? When you get, when you're walking in your house mm-hmm. and you get hit on the toe or you bump your toe against the couch, that pain, it makes you, it, sometimes it can make you go crazy. Yeah. Like you don't know what to do with so much pain. That was what I was feeling. I was like, now, this chick keeps beating me up. Life is beating me up. Hatu elewani with my parents. Um, mm. uh, 
I can't, I was trying to, I was trying to adapt to normalcy or what people um, term as normalcy. Wake up in the morning, uh, shower, have breakfast, go to work, do your work, come back home, have dinner, go to bed, repeat. I was trying to adapt to that because I'd, I'd already done my night shift for such a long time that I didn't know what normal was. Mm. So I struggled to get to it and just got to a place where I needed, I needed help. Yeah. And my dad had reached out and he was like, look, I can see that you're going through something. Let me help you. Mm. That's when he, he told me, go see this doctor. He will tell you what to do. And he referred me to the doctor in Chiromo, Chiromo hospital. That is, and hey, I was just like, if I'm going to go to hospital to become better, see, we just get worse now. Like how? how? <laughs> I still remember that point. I was just like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Funny, how bad can it get? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I took my dad's car. He knew. Um, one thing about, about uh, my dad is that he trusts me. Yeah. We're three in our family. My older sister, me, and then there's a smaller brother. If he takes the car, damn. And it's six. The sun is going down and he's not back. That's a problem. Yeah. He'd, he'll be called. But I took the car. I went out and I was like, okay. To Haribu. Now just indulge. And I, I sat in the car with, uh, with a friend. But... Sikona feel vibe yeah. Because they're on this whole serious conversation vibe. Me, yeah. So drank, chewed, went home, sat in the car for hours, and I was like, okay. The sun is coming up, and now like this is a new chapter. So let's do this. Mm. And yeah, I I went to hospital and wow, let me tell you. <laughs> you my mom tells me you don't know how well off you are health wise until you go to a hospital. Mm. The experience was something else. Like there there are some bad hospitals, or let me say like standard wise, yeah. But Chiromo is one of the best. And you, I, uh, well, I, I noticed that from the room when I first walked into the room. This place looked like a hotel. Big bed, long uh, drapes, big windows. And they even put shampoo in your bathroom. <laughs> so I was like, okay, it's not, it's not so bad. Because I thought mental hospital, okay, uh, the straight jackets, mm. the needles, the guys in white. No, no, no. It's not like that. Yeah. <clears throat> when, when everybody went away, now my friend Esther, who'd taken me and my brother, uh, when they went home and you're, when I was left in the room, I was like, okay, now I'm alone. I don't know what to do. Uh, the nurse brought dinner to the room. And after eating... And she gave, she gave me some medication. I started feeling uh, queasy, blacked out. I woke up and there was another bed and another guy. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't yeah. hear uh, people coming in. Yeah. But his name is Peter. Peter is an AP officer. And yeah. he used to be, he was deployed in uh, Wajir. And he's seen a lot of shit. Yeah. And what like surprised me about this guy is that he was open about what he's gone through. Mm. Also probably because we were sick. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he gave me so such gruesome stories but his reality was so damaged mm. that he he'd got into that fuck it phase mm. and every single day waking up and w with Peter there like I'd feel better for myself mm. 
and I'd see him changing because he would he didn't eat I think for the first two days or something, and then he gradually started uh, eating, coming up to to the dining area with us, and then you start making friends. Well, you start choosing who you want your friends to be, yeah. because well, we're in a hospital, a mental hospital. There are those who are really badly off, uh, the schizophrenia patients. You have people talking to themselves in that corner. This one is drawing on the ground. That one is you doing what? It is funny, <laughs> but um, I made friends with people I didn't even. Think I could make friends with mm. a 13 year old in hospital, uh, a really old man, and a lady who's been going through shock therapy. Wow! Yeah. So my experience in Chiromo it, it was an eye open. It made me gain more understanding uh, about life, mm. about how to handle things, about who's going to be there for you. And also, who's really not there for you? Yeah, yeah. I think like um, rough patches in life have a way of doing that. Like it just smacks you in terms of reality of friendships and what a community looks like. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, what were you feeling after your ADHD diagnosis? Because I feel like sometimes when when you have a word for what it is, like when you were talking about like. When you were younger, we put in the special category, etc. When you have a word, it's like, oh, wait, so it's a thing. What the promise is not in my head. It's a thing, you know. Um, what kind of were, were the feelings that came with the diagnosis? Relief. Mm. Wow. I, I was a whole different, I was, I was a new person. Mm. I had a new life. I, it's like... <laughs> I've heard people who've gotten uh, glasses, specs before mm. saying this, like when I got them, this is how you guys see things. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Everything's so clear. Yeah. And that, that was it. Uh, well, I didn't, it didn't hit me until uh, the next day, went home, slept, got up and I woke up fresh. Mm. I'm like, okay, this is new. Mm. and then I'm motivated okay and then I can plan my day yeah. no way yeah. <laughs> so um, before this everything was okay let's get up okay we have this to do that to do this to do that okay so what do we start with I start with this I leave that there let's go to this mm. to the, but then now I could be able to start a task, complete it, put that away, go to the next thing. Yeah. yeah. Even conversations. Like <laughs> I'd be talking to someone and I'm not interrupting. Cause before the diagnosis, um, people would, would like, would say stuff like, you're cool to talk to, but mm -hmm. and then jumping, from this story to another story to another story and being able to circle back and go pick up. Yeah. But then I could actually plan. Yeah. I had strategy. I had understanding. But most of all, it was self-understanding. I understood myself. I understood that what I was going through, the struggles I was going through as a child, not being able to to be normal mm. was not a bad thing. Mm. This thing that I was beaten about wasn't a bad thing. Mm. And then those were, there were rough patches as, as, you call, as, you, as you've called them, but I learned that that's not, that's not me. Yeah. I am different. So now because I am different, how will I be able to live my life? And that's a strategy that I'm talking about. So I started putting myself in places whereby I understood how to, to do or navigate around these, these places better than I used to. Mm. 
So if something was difficult for me, I learned that I could speak up about it. Mm. Say what's on my mind with no criticism. And if there is, I'd be like, okay, cool. That's what you think. But to be able to accept yourself and accept that this is my reality, this is my life, and this is what um, I was born to do, then things became easier. And I have to say, you actually did um, teach me without knowing that you were teaching me. When we were setting up, when we were going to come and record, we actually recorded here. Yeah. I called you and you said, oh, no, I've just woken up. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and I think I said something so ignorant, like, yeah, I actually think it was ignorant because I said, oh, man, I wish I was sleeping, not in like a talk down way. I no. genuinely wished like I was in bed <laughs> at that time. But sometimes you say things and you don't really understand the situation someone is going through. And when we met to record, you said, actually, I've come out of a slump. And I really appreciated that honesty because then now I knew where to meet you, right? So even with that in mind, how do you bring up, hey, this is who I am. This is a diagnosis I have in relationships, um, whether it's intimate or friendships or at work. How does that come up? I think you did it so beautifully with me. And I was like, okay, I've learned something one. And then now in this interaction, I can meet you where you are. Yeah. It's not easy talking about what you're going through up here, especially if you don't understand it. Mm. But when you, when you hear yourself, your, your inner voice, when you listen to it, it makes you understand more about like what you're going through. Okay. Opening up about uh, your mental disorder is not easy. It's draining. It's it's embarrassing um, sometimes. Uh, but to accept that this is what you have. And to understand that you have an, a, a special skill set makes things easier. Mm. So, for example, at work, I had to, I had to know who I am telling what I am telling. Mm. As I pointed out on the on the podcast episode, um, I work for the government, so you can imagine telling someone with, of power that you have a disorder in government yeah <laughs> they will cut you off yeah be like hey this guy can't do his work mm. and i had to choose who i am telling there's my boss my former boss uh albert he's the one who pushed me to to looking for a solution because he was like your 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 productivity is going down yeah you're sleepy almost all the time you're either sleepy or sleeping on your desk and i i was snapping at people at my coworkers. Mm -hmm. so he was like you really need to find out like what's going on yeah so after i got my diagnosis and i went back to work i went to him and i told him this is what i've been told this is what i've been told i can do and this is what i can't do one of the things I couldn't do is take coffee, take tea, um, put too much uh, pressure, yeah. tasks that would pressure me. Uh, so I told him that this is what I can handle. Yeah. And he was okay with it. He was like, okay, so you can be able to work from this time to this time? Cool. All I need is uh, to understand that you know you have a, a quota to fill. Mm. We have revenue to collect, so do it. And that's how I slowly began um, understanding that there's something called boundaries. Mm. Don't tell every, anybody any everything, and don't tell everybody anything that you just pop up in your mind. Yeah. So I started understanding that 
there are certain people that I was working with that didn't um, wish the best for me. Mm. So an example of that is one of my colleagues that overheard me telling someone else about my medication. And they went and told someone else and it became an office rumor. Mm. So they wanted to use that against me at some point. But I just told them like the top layer, I'm not feeling well. This mm. is my medication. This is what I need to take. And yeah, this is how I'm going to live my life. Yeah. Family wise. Uh, <laughs> Uh, That's also a tricky one to navigate. Family. Well, my mom is not, she's, she's not for, she's not pro-medicine. Mm. Uh, same to my dad. Um, but she believes that you need to take them in, like, at this time. Like, you're not feeling good. You need to take these meds. And she asked me a question, are you going to take them forever? Before uh, I took this recent holiday, I did believe that I am going to be on my medication until I die. Mm. But I got a re recently I got a diagnosis from uh, my new doctor, Dr. Martinez, who said that the doctor who prescribed those meds to me the three medications, that's uh, Prodep, Quetipine, and uh, Concerta, mm. was actually poisoning me. Oh my word, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like that combination was not yeah. working. Yeah. And he he started me, uh, he started a whole different uh, prescription. He calls it a recipe of two different medications, mm. an antidepressant and, and one to help me sleep it's for anxiety. So... Mom asked me the same question. Now that you've seen another doctor, are you going to be on these meds forever? And I told her no. What Martinez has told me is that once I get to 100 milligrams, then I stop taking oh, the meds. Wow. Like that process is over. Yeah. But if I do feel like um, I'm digressing, going back into that state, go see him. We figure out what's triggered whatever and see how to handle it. Yeah. Siblings, tough, but <laughs> that tough was <laughs> from your heart. Tough. T for tough. T for tough. Uh, I haven't talked. My sister and I haven't talked about my ADHD diagnosis. Okay. No, like I think the most she knows is that I go to hospital. Uh, I have a therapist, and there's medication I take. Mm -hmm done yeah my small bro he likes taking advantage of the fact that i went to hospital mm. not to talk shit about him but he 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 once came into my house drunk and he was like he i was i was there when when you're going to hospital i'm the one who took you to hospital you see you're not even feeling well and started talking down to me mm. about it. Mm. But I asked him one question. Do you know what ADHD is? Yeah. Do you know what I'm going through? And he blabbered through his, his alcohol, but he, he went away. And that made me understand that, okay, this is another part, of, this is another set of boundaries that I have to put up. Wow. Yeah. Put boundaries around your siblings to, to not get hurt. Mm. Let them know what they need to know. Mm. What they, everything else, what they, what they think they, they should know. Mm -mm. Give them the top layer. Tell them what's going on and leave it at that. Yeah. If they have anything against you or if they use it against you, then cool. Yeah. Sorry, on that note, can I just ask for like a round of applause? Like that was so... Um, allowing yourself to be that vulnerable with us it, like i really do appreciate it okay. and even just understanding because like africans we don't talk about boundaries in families <laughs> and you know <laughs> so i really appreciate that the last bit relationship yeah uh before we were an item 
I told her straight up. I've come from hospital. I've been told this. I've been diagnosed with this. Yeah. And this is how it is. Yeah. That to me was was something like no one has ever done something like that. Like to accept me mm. for who I am. Mm. And I I told her that I love up days, downs. And sometimes I won't be able to see a way through some of these issues. And she helps me through them. Yeah. But to be able to open up to to her and tell her that babe, Leo, Leo Nikubaya. Yeah. And not be judged for it, not to be taken for granted, and to be accepted. She let me be that couch potato mm. because I need to be that couch potato at that time. Mm. And when I'm getting off of that, or rather out of that rabbit hole, she's still there. Mm. So in my relationship with her, it's simple. Open up, talk about it, find a solution. And can I just say, well, I don't want to put her on the spot, but like wherever you are, can I just send like love to her? I'm trying to like see <laughs> who makes eye contact. I'm like, aha. Um, because that was some of the things that come up, right? Where there is some part of, I want to say responsibility with you in terms of communicating, but there are times when you have dependent on the condition that even that communication is like so difficult. Exactly. So having someone who can read that and kind of stay in the periphery is so powerful and love is so healing as well. Well, Adele, one thing is I've just remembered <laughs> um, at the beginning, she, she, she was like, tell me about ADHD. Oh, wow. And she asked about like the history, like for you to get to that depression, because I was diagnosed with major, uh, a major depressive disorder. Yeah. She, she wanted to know what happened, what this ADHD is. She wanted to know the medication, mm. when I take it, how it reacts and like, will it change me? Mm. When the when when I drank alcohol that one time and <laughs> crashed, but then I thought it's over. Like yeah. now this person has seen me in a whole different light. Yeah. And the stories that I was telling her that I went to hospital, I've come out a different person. Uh, I'm on medication. I'm not going to drink anymore. And then I end up drinking and wrecking the car. I thought that like that would be. That's that's um, evidence enough that we should not continue. Yeah. But that wasn't it. She wanted to understand that. She wanted to understand what drove me to doing what I did, mm. and how to avoid that situation happening ever again. Wow. Yeah. So it's like grace and love. This is <laughs> so wonderful. I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Um, is there a question, Caleb? Oh, here. Okay, hello, hi. Hi. So I like I listening to your story, I like really connected with you. And I wanted to know, like, how do you reconcile the fact that you are masculine and you grew up in Africa with the fact that you have to talk about mental illness? And yes, it's easy talking about it uh, in front of Adele on the stage, but how do you reconcile now? I'm out the, outside there in the real world. And okay, I'm talking in terms of me. And maybe even connecting with chicks because very many um, women see it as as weakness, for a lack of a better word. They're like, see, you're Africa, you are weak, you know, like having a mental issue and you're a man, like it's unheard of, right? So so how do you reconcile that? Uh, you, you've talked about it and, and you've had like a support system around you. But what about that guy or that person who doesn't have a support system, right? What about the person who is experiencing it with their friends and everything? And then a second question is, 
what do you normally do when you're meeting new people? Like, I know, like, you've talked about your mom and she knows and, you know, you, you dad and everything. What is about the new people that you meet on a day-to-day basis? You know, what if you moved companies, what if you, you, you meet new friends, right? How do you break the walls that you've constructed around, like, that mental barrier? Because you're like, okay, what if they think I'm weird? What if they think that, you know, I am, I'm not a good friend? Like, how do you deconstruct those walls and, like, build a bridge for them to cross over and actually allow yourself to be vulnerable with them, right? Again, uh, the last question is, what do you normally do? Like, apart from the meds and apart from therapy, what else do you normally do? Because from the people I've interacted with, they have this thing we call object permanence. Um, people who have ADHD. So what do you normally do apart from therapy and apart from um, the meds? What else do you do to, to help you cope with some of the things that you, that you encounter on a daily basis. Thank you. Okay. Those are three really powerful questions. How yeah. do you interact with, if it's women who hold this stereotype of what an African man is, um, how do you bridge the gap when it's it's different people? And yeah. what was the second one? I forgot the middle one. Uh, what 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 I do. Okay, uh, yes. Yeah. With that ADHD. One. Yeah. Sorry. What's your name? Peterson. Peterson. Yeah. Okay. Do you get headaches? Do you get stomach aches? You have one right now. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Do you get stomach aches? A lot. Do you sometimes get bruised? Okay. So you're human. Adele, do you get headaches? Yes, sir. Uh, hi. What's your name? Nyokabi. Nyokabi. Do you get headaches? Stomach aches? Do you get hurt sometimes? Okay. Hurt, bruised, yeah. So she's human. We all have something in common, yeah. We we struggle, and as a man, you should understand that they're not any different. Mm. Okay, doesn't uh, matter what um, social class you're in or you've put yourself in. It doesn't matter what kind of a man you were told you're supposed to be, but you should be you, okay? So when it comes to talking to a chick about what you're going through, if she doesn't listen, so (laughs) you can't force her to listen. Remember that... uh, Ladies also have the right to accept, um, to accept things, to accept people. Like you have the right, they have rights. Okay, but if you t- if you're talking to someone and they just see you as this watermelon to ukoto, no kona mashida mingi oeleweki, then that person isn't for you. Mm. But aside from like a relationship. Uh, perspective you shouldn't be scared of talking about what you're going through because you don't know who else in the crowd is going through what you are going through i have a headache right now so we're sort of going through the same thing don't um and these are lessons that i've learned here don't don't compare your situation with someone else's. Your headache might be worse than mine. Yours can be a migraine. But nevertheless, you're going through something. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to encourage guys, like if you're going through something, open up. Because by going back home in your room, isolating yourself, it doesn't help. It makes things worse. Because now you sit there with your problems and you're not able to see past them. Mm. But if you come to understand that um, this is where I am, this is how I am feeling, and I am human, and other people might be feeling the same thing, and you open up, you'll see that probably it wasn't even any it wasn't a big deal Mm. okay so 
your second question first don't don't blab out don't be like yo me i have adhd by the way eh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> not everybody is uh, receptive watu wengine wanaanza wanaanza kutusi um don't expect mm. i don't know you peterson so i don't come to you with the expectation of you'll understand what, what i am talking about go there with an open mind open heart listen to them and after you listen to them just find middle ground and if there is a vacuum whereby you can speak about your side of your story talk about it cuz i find i find it um i lost the word it, i don't like being ashamed mm. of of my situation that's why i usually say adhd is a superpower mm. yeah so i'm not ashamed of talking about my diagnosis because to me it's made me a better person mm. to me it's made me see life differently but also to me it's made me see people differently mm. okay so if the new person you've met sees that vacuum before you do and they talk to you about their issue receive it don't don't put it to heart don't take it to heart receive it listen to them you might not have a solution not everybody by the way when they talk to you uh, they're looking for a solution mm. sometimes they just, they're just looking for someone who will will hear them out yeah so receive what they're saying if you have one or two things to to like uh chip in about it say it yeah let them know that they're not they're not daft for opening up mm-hmm. i was uh, i talked to adel um i told you about the people who've been communicating uh sending me dms yeah. i don't know them they don't know me they listen to my story and also many others on on legally clueless but some of them have like common issues yeah but what i usually tell them is thank you for telling me thank you for opening up to me and sharing that with me mm. uh the third one was what do i do yeah um apart from the meds apart from treatment and therapy yeah and therapy uh i talk to people so i talk to people okay when i say I talk to people i don't mean i go up i go to the streets and be like yo skiza yeah. mean it was steve eh? <laughs> no 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 uh if i find my situation if, if i find my my if i find myself in a situation where kuna someone new i don't know them and they begin conversing or we start talking about something no yeah it's nice to learn something uh my dog oh yeah Bruno. i like that part of your story when you talked about your dog i adopted a dog i was living <laughs> i was living in a in a bed sitter in my mahio and i have friends who work at KS- kspca and other trust foundations yeah and this girl texts me she's like yo there's a dog that needs a home Mm. and you told me you're looking for a dog will you take the dog are you interested yeah i was like okay send me the details i'll i'll see fast forward went to the to the house i saw the dog the dog loved me yeah and i said i'm coming for you bruno is a german shepherd he was about one year and a couple of months if i'm not wrong then uh i moved back to my mahio with him so i'm in a small house with a big ass dog <laughs> <laughs> but i wasn't alone mm. and there's a way that dogs usually are able to read your your vibe yeah this guy would come and sit next to me look at me and then sometimes he'd give me puppy ears like his ears would just flop to the back oh my goodness <laughs> his eyes are just there and i'm like okay i had a shit day okay yeah but you're cute yeah. <laughs> so i'd pet him and 
I feel better. Yeah. yeah. Another thing is I don't hide anything. Okay, some things uh, from my parents. Because I came to realize that they are the support that I can always fall back on. Mm. So I can go to therapy. I can take my meds. I can hug Bruno. <laughs> I can walk. But I won't get the same... Um, what can I call it? Relief. Like knowing my parents knows I'm struggling with this. Mm. And they'll help me through it. Us. That's so wonderful. Um, that is just so wonderful. And I think even just witnessing this, like you asked this question and another guy is giving <laughs> you, so it's just so nice to see. Um, <laughs> sorry guys, I'm so mushy. Um, and I hope you guys connect afterwards. And that's that's the, the idea of this community is yeah. to connect and keep those, those channels open. And I just have to say, I'm so thankful. Thank you that you shared your story on the podcast that you reached out and the work that you're doing and and i just i told you on whatsapp yeah. i really think he's just in the beginning of the work that you're meant to be doing Thank you. you know and so please give washira a warm round of applause Thank you for watching this episode. Make sure you listen to our weekly podcast on all streaming platforms and stay up to date with our workshops and events on legallyclueless.africa.com.